Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah. Elhamdülillahi hamdun kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fih mubarakan alayh kama yuhibbu rabbuna wa yarda jalla jalaluhu wa amma nawaluh. Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidil habibil mustafa sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم طاسيم تلك آيات الكتاب المبين نتلو عليك من نبأ موسى وفرعون بالحق لقوم يؤمنون إن فرعون على في الأرض وجعل أهلها شيعا يستضعف طائفة منهم يذبح أبناءهم ويستحيي نساءهم إنه كان من المفسدين ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ صدق الله العظيم That's the beginning of the story of Musa alayhi salam and uh, the reason why I bring Musa alayhi salam here is that the story of Pharaoh on its own cannot be, cannot be completed without the story of Musa alayhi salam In fact Pharaoh is only relevant because of Musa alayhi salam and because of his tyranny if you go to Egypt today, to Cairo, and you go into the British-made uh, uh, museum, there's a massive structure, it's called the Pharaonic Museum, they've got an Islamic museum, but there's a Pharaonic Museum, if you go inside there, what you will actually notice is that uh, at the time I went there, I paid about 40 Egyptian pounds to get in, that was my ticket. Uh, when you get onto the second or third floor, I can't remember anymore, but when you get onto the second or third floor, then you have to pay again if you want to go into this particular chamber. And there, I remember, if I remember correctly, I had to pay 90 Egyptian pounds. So 40 at the door, and then to see this just one room, you had to pay 90. So that's more than double. Now, now has anybody been there? Okay, one person. Okay. So it's okay, I'm going to save you your money today anyway. That particular room in there is essentially the mummy room. So you have about nine mummies there. And the most interesting thing, and maybe this is something that I'm supposed to mention at the end, but I'm going to mention it right at the beginning, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Pharaoh, uh, he, he says in the Quran to Pharaoh, Today I'm going to give you respite with your body so that you be a sign. You be a lesson, a sign. So what is it that out of all of these various different dynasties and nations that have come and gone from this world, this one particular one of the pharaohs is such that they used to mummify their dead, their deceased, especially their, uh, their, their wealthy and elite. And thus, they're still preserved until today. Now, if I'm to ask you, how long ago did, uh, was pharaoh around in this world? Could you tell me? How many years ago? Oh, hundreds or thousands of years ago. Anybody have an idea? Just to get, give you an idea of how Allah pres has, pre preser has preserved, uh, preserved his body. Anybody know? Well, it's about 4,000 years. So we're talking about 2,000 years until Isa alayhi salam. Because we're in 2015, uh, nearly 16. Uh, and we're talking about 2,000 years before Isa alayhi salam is when Musa alayhi salam was around. So we're talking about over 4,000 years. Now, if you go into that museum, you'll actually see everything in there from Pharaoh's Rolls Royce to his needle. What I mean by Rolls Royce is his chariot. You'll see everything in there, and that's five floors full of this stuff. And they've got so much more in the basement that they haven't even put up. And they, they reckon that they're actually going to find another room uh, very soon in the Valley of the Kings that has been until now unknown. Now, the most interesting thing that I find is, number one, Pharaoh's body was only discovered about 150 years ago. It wasn't around all the time, meaning we didn't see it. It was existing. Uh, Allah's words have always been true. But can you imagine the iman of the believers, the faith of the believers of the preceding centuries, all the way from Rasulullah's time down to when that body was discovered? 
what they must have thought about this verse, which says that I'm, Allah is saying, I'm going to give you respite with your body. I'm going to preserve your body so that you be a sign for the people after you. Their iman must have been very strong that there doesn't seem to be a body around, but they still believed in it. Or is it that our iman is actually so weak in the unseen that it had to be revealed in our time? Right? So that's something I'll leave you to think about. But what's most interesting is whatever Allah has said is absolutely true. And thus, after 1300 years, you find this body. And not only do you find him, but when Allah does something, he does it wholesome. He does it completely. He does it perfectly. He doesn't do just something very, you know, something very tiny, but he adds everything to it. So not only did they find Pharaoh, but they actually found everything to do with him. Subhanallah. It's obviously something that was placed into the minds of these people to preserve all of these things and have this tradition. Who was this Pharaoh? There's a number of opinions. The strongest opinion seems to be that it's Ramses II. However, there's other opinions that it's, ne uh, it's uh, another one called Medem Tar. Now they're both there. They're both mummy, or both mummies are in that place, in that room. Now, as I said, I'll save you some money. You don't need to go there to see it. I specifically went, paid for it, because I felt that if Allah has preserved this for us as a lesson, then let me go and try to take a lesson, right? Just in case somebody starts saying that you're entertaining yourself and it's haram and this, that, and the other. I don't know, Allahu alam, you get different fatwas around. So um, if you want to see him, though, all you have to do is check online. Ramses II images and there he will be, you'll be able to see him. But it doesn't do the same thing, it's just a 2D picture. When you actually go there and you actually see the curves of the body and so on, that's when you actually notice that this is a human being. This was a human being. And look how Allah preserved it. It looks a bit shrunk and shriveled. But other than that, it's amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had him preserved. Saved him from the ocean, from drowning at the last minute. Now, how does that story start? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that we are going to tell you the story of Moses, story of Musa alayhi salam and Pharaoh. We're going to tell it to you with the truth. Why does he have to say, I'm going to tell you the truth? Because one is that if, you find, if you're coming with a new story and you don't have a prior version of that story, there's no way to verify whether this is true or not. How do you verify that something is the truth or not? But because the story of Pharaoh is abound, uh, it's, uh, it's part of the people of the book, the Christians and the Jews. This story is famous. It was told, it was passed down, it was known. And I'm sure most of us, most people, if they know any story of Pharaoh, it's the Hollywood version. Right? It's the screen version, which I have refused to watch. Like, adamantly refused to watch. And the reason I say that is because I don't want the picture of Musa salam, as some actor, whoever that actor is. I don't even know who plays that part or in, in whichever version of it, but I don't want for the rest of my life that every time I think of Musa alayhi salam, I see some guy who reckons he's Musa alayhi salam for that time. Right? I just don't want that. I want just leave it in my mind and hopefully on the day of judgment see him inshallah. In Jannah, inshallah. So Allah says, we're going to tell you the truth. We're going to tell it with the truth. Which means that any other stories you know out there, there's been a lot of hearsay, there's been a lot of additions and masala as we call it, that's been added, that happens to any story. And clearly that's happened to these stories as well. And, but we're going to tell you the facts. And we're only going to tell you the facts that matter to you, that you can take a lesson from. So we're not going to go into entertaining detail. Because the Qur'an is not a form of entertainment, it's a form of reflection. So we're going to give you the parts that are to reflect on. And if you listen carefully, and you read carefully the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells this story, it's amazing in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala slips in additional information here and there that causes us to reflect. I will also say at the outset that I d I'm not going to even try to cover the entire story. Because that's impossible in the time that we've been given because then it'll just be a rush job. All I'm going to try to do, right, is to try to take some lessons from a few of the stories as we read along and see how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to do. So we're just going to touch on a few different subjects here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, we're doing this for the people who believe. You need a certain level of belief to believe in the Qur'an. Otherwise, it's just like any other source for you. Anyway, it carries on. Inna fir'auna ala fil ard. The Pharaoh... This Pharaoh, Medem Tar, Ramses II, whoever it was, we'll just call him Pharaoh. By the way, Pharaoh was a title of the, of the leaders of the time of Egypt. So the leaders of Egypt, they were called Pharaohs. 
So Pharaoh, when you say Pharaoh, it was not specific, specifically speaking about a specific in, uh, individual when you say Pharaoh in general, although this Pharaoh becomes the most notorious. One thing was that Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had an encounter with Egypt. What happened in Egypt is that uh, when Ibrahim alayhi salam went from Babylon to Haran and to, uh, to, to Jerusalem, he took an incursion into Misr, into Egypt. That's where, if you know the story, uh, I'm not going to go into it. Uh, uh, th th there was a, a, a very tyrannical king there who used to, he, he was a maniac, a sex maniac, in a sense. Right? He liked to take women away and use them, any beautiful woman. So there was uh, an encounter with Ibrahim alayhi salam and Sarah alayhi salam. Now, alhamdulillah, Allah saved Sarah alayhi salam from any approaches of this man. But Ibrahim alayhi salam did say that they will be coming from my, my, gen, my, my uh, uh, descendants, somebody who, upon whose hands the destruction of Egypt will take place. So this information had been passed through the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. Children of Israel generally refers to Ya'qub alayhi salam's na name was Israel, Israel. Harrama Israelu ala nafsi, as Allah says in the Quran. So Israel is Ya'qub alayhi salam. That's Israel. Israel, Il, Ibr uh, Ismail, Ibrahim, Israel, Jibra'il, Jabra'il, Mikail, Israfil. These are all Allah's, you know, the servant of Allah. It's like Abdullah in Arabic. These are Hebrew names, right? Just, just for your information. These are Hebrew names. Means the servant of Allah. The servant of the Rahman, the servant, uh, you know, the different names related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now what happens is, Ibrahim alayhi salam had mentioned that. This had passed down in his descendants. So the Bani Israel, who the Pharaoh had then enslaved, who then they had ensla he had enslaved, they used to use this as their kind of uh, Mahdi coming. You know, like today people are so complacent about the fact that we can't do anything with the situation the Muslims are in the world today and we just have to wait for the Mahdi and they've become complacent, they've become a defeatist, uh, they've taken on this defeatist mentality, just sat back and uh, doing nothing, right? So uh, that is, it seems like this was their story that would make them happy, right? Now, what Allah says in the Quran is Pharaoh was high-handed and tyrannical in the world وَجَعَلَ أَهْلَهَا شِيعًا يَسْتَضْعِفُ طَائِفَةً مِّنْهُمْ يُذَبِّحُ أَبْنَاءُهُمْ وَيَسْتَحِي نِسَاءَهُمْ He enslaved an entire people. He enslaved an entire people. That's what Allah says. He would kill their children, slaughter their children, their boys, and he would keep their women alive. And there's a special story about this. إِنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُفْسِدِينَ But, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ There is so much hope in this verse. We wanted, as Allah says, we wanted to favor the people who were considered to be weak, who were taken as weaklings, who had been oppressed, who had been subjugated, who had been weakened and enslaved. Now, again, going back to Egypt uh, of today and the, uh, this museum, and you see all of these things in this massive five-story structure, and everything is slave labor. All of that Every product in there, every article and artifact in there is all slave labor. Bani Israel. He had the whole tribe enslaved. Because Israel, Ya'qub alayhi salam, had 12 children. Right, had 12 children. Sulaiman alayhi salam came from one of his children, I believe from Yahuda. Whereas Musa alayhi salam came from uh, another, one, uh, another one of uh, Ya'qub alayhi salam's children. So these were all Bani Israel. The children of Israel. The Israelites as they call them. So... He had enslaved them and he had put them to work. They were a subjugated people. Now Allah says that we wanted to favor the people who had been weak and oppressed. We wanted to make them the leaders. We wanted to make them leaders. And we also wanted them to be the inheritors of whatever is going to be left from this legacy. Now that gives a lot of hope for weak people because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps weak people. So if there's any reason for us to look at the story of Pharaoh, one of the biggest lessons you get from the story of Pharaoh is that he was this tyrant who had everything at his disposal and he would do anything to preserve that. And that, that is where it gets uh, really, really, really problematic with him. 
So then it says, we wanted, then Allah continues and says, we wanted them to be the leaders, we wanted them to be the inheritors, we wanted to give them power in the world, and we wanted Nuriya Fir'auna wa Hamana wa Junudahuma minhum makanu yahdharoon. And we wanted to show Pharaoh and his main minister, Haman, uh, Haman, they said, was actually sometimes worse than Pharaoh because sometimes Pharaoh, they said, would have these thoughtful, reflective moments. And Haman was the one who used to drive him sometimes, like the evil minister of his. So that's why he's actually spoken about in the Quran. And he's singled out as well. So we wanted to show Pharaoh and Haman and their armies what they were frightened of. Now, what were they frightened of? Right. Obviously, there's something they're frightened of for Allah to be mentioning that. So now let's go back to what I mentioned is what Ibrahim a.s. had promised or what he had prophesied. This information about somebody coming from the Bani Israel and, be, and destroying, Egypt, uh, destroying the rule of Egypt. So they used to be hoping for that. Now what happens is there's two stories. One is uh, this information had gone through the Bani Israel to their masters, the Copts. This would, these were the, peop uh, pe uh, the, the people of Pharaoh. And of course, this news reached Pharaoh himself. He was concerned. He was super superstitious. He was concerned. Then he sees a dream. He sees a dream. And that dream frightened him because it seemed to be this rumor or this prophecy come true in his mind. So he gets really angry. He gets really angry. Now, although he's having these signs... He doesn't reflect. And anybody in this world who becomes too indulgent and loving of the world, they will not reflect. Because they think they have a false, they have a false sense of security. You know, when you have everything around you, and you have money that can buy you anything, and you have friends in high places, and you have contacts, and you can get anything done that you want, and there's not much that stands in your way, then you forget about Allah. Because this, as human beings are, psychologically, the more power we get, the more corrupted we have the possibility of becoming. The more immune we feel, the more stronger we become, and we, that, that gets to our mind. So you're in intoxicated with your power. That's why, although Pharaoh is having a lot of these signs, as it continues as well, it's very difficult to move away from your comfortable position of where you are, with everything at your hands. And that's what the difficulty is. Now, what was he? He was obviously, uh, we wanted to show him and them what they were frightened of. So, وَأُوحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِي Now, the Quran doesn't mention specifically what Pharaoh started to do. It alludes to it by saying that he killed all the boys. Now, what happens here is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. So, what Pharaoh did after he saw that dream, he went and asked, his, uh, uh, his religious men, his religious men, and they told him that there will be a boy from the Bani Israel who will destroy your kingdom. So now how do you save yourself from that? Now look at the parallels here. First and foremost, when Allah wants to destroy somebody, He creates a context for it. He creates a context. Generally, before the destruction of anything, the people who are supposed to be destroyed will become even more tyrannical and oppressive. Because Allah wants to establish proof against people. He wants to show people, I mean, He wants it that people, uh, if He wants to destroy somebody, He's not going to destroy innocent people. He's not going to uh, humiliate, uh, destroy in a humiliating way innocent people. He will uh, destroy people who are tyrannical by letting them do their tyranny, acting out their tyranny, and then He will catch them at a very, very vulnerable position, in a very vulnerable situation. So he creates the context. And you can see in this case, there's a context being created. And I think we can draw parallels, inshallah, and, and feel for the people who are being oppressed around the world, that it, it, it can only get worse to get better. That's the principle we learn from the Quran. It can only get worse to get better. Because when things get worse, that means there's a difficulty. And as Allah says, inna ma'al usri yusra. With every difficulty comes ease. So now here, there's a context being made here. Now what, what happens is, he starts killing all the boys. So all newborns, they are dying. They're being killed. Now can you imagine what a gruesome thing that is? But how does he get away with it? Because of impunity. Because there's nobody that he has to answer to. He was one, remember, who used to say, Ana rabbukum al -a I am your highest lord. 
He used to, when the, w w later on, which I'm probably not going to have time to go through, but when the, the, the magicians challenged Musa, salam, Musa salam challenged the magicians, and they all then became believers in Musa salam, after seeing that he seemed to have a higher form of what they call sorcery or magic, and that this was something beyond that from Allah, they became Muslim. You know what he says to them? He says to them, you started to believe without me giving permission to you? As though. You know, like, why am I going to give you permission? You know, what, why are you going to give us permission to believe somebody else? But that's how arrogant he was. That's how arrogant he was. Now, in order to remove your paranoia, to remove your, uh, 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 your insecurity, what do you do? You go out of your way and be oppressive and you justify it. What he started doing is killing everybody. This is a similar thing to what powerful nations do here of preemptive strikes of killing people before they've even done anything, of going into places and trying to destabilize them, going into places and trying to get them under control if they have a fear over these things. You see this pharaonic action, almost as if pharaoh is this generic way of tyrants to deal with somebody. And essentially that's what it is, it's a pharaonic style. And you see that, you see that if you read this story carefully, if you look at this story, there is so much to be learned from here. But for us, there's so much hope that should come from this story. So as he started killing everybody and leaving the girls alive, boys are dead. For several, you know, for, for a number of years he did this. Now the, his own people started to complain. We don't have any workers. There's nobody to help us. There, there's no boys left. Right? What's going to happen? You're not going to procreate. The next generation is going to die if there's, no, if there's only females and no males. So then he was given an idea that you're just going to have to do one year on, one year off. Because it's just, a, it's just a, a weird idea to kill every boy there is. I mean, how long can you do that for? So now what happens is, um, this enslaved community, just another point. Today in the modern world, we've come up with different ideas of enslaving people. No longer do you do it in the way Pharaoh did it, and put them in shackles and make them work for you and put them into the conventional kind of slave attitude. Today we enslave people without letting them know that they're slaves, by them liking the fact that they're slaves. And this is by using indulgence in the world, by using these kind of uh, uh, ideas, these kind of ideas of indulgence in the world by giving them, by intoxicating them, intoxicating them with entertainment, intoxicating them with entertainment, intoxicating them with just greed, with, uh, you know, with sexual indulgence and everything else, all these vices and that. That's how people are enslaved. They like that, they suddenly start to like that, 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 uh, that style and where nobody tells you anything, where nobody says anything to you and then that's it. You become followers of this. How is it possible in places, in, in many Muslim countries that they, th this, is what, this is the kind of style that they prefer to live in. That, that's the whole idea here. Now, Harun alayhi salam, the brother of Musa alayhi salam, he's born in a year when the killing doesn't take place. So he's safe. Then Musa alayhi salam's mother is pregnant again. And she is going to have Musa alayhi salam in the year that people are killed, that boys are being killed. So Allah says in the Quran, وَأُوحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ in a, uh, 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 that what, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa alayhi salam's mum is that put him into a box. Into a box and put him into the river. So what Ibn Kathir mentions is that Musa alayhi salam's mother used to put him in a box whenever there was an inquiry that used to come. She had the baby secretly. She didn't n announce it. And what she did, she, her, her house, their house was on the bank of the Nile. So what they would do is she would put him in a box and tie a rope to him and then hide that rope. So then he would just be floating outside like some kind of box or something on a string. And as they, uh, when they would go, then she would pull him back in. That's how she kept doing this. On one occasion though, you see, Allah wanted something to happen. And this is not the way it was going to happen. So on one occasion, she let him go and forgot to tie the string. And suddenly this box disappears. Now you can imagine what the feeling of this mother is when her boy goes. So he goes and he ends up again on the bank of the Nile outside Pharaoh's house. Outside Pharaoh's palace rather. They bring him inside. 
And it says that some of them didn't, you know, the, 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 the servants who had found him didn't want to even open the box. They weren't unsure. And suddenly, it's his wife, Pharaoh's wife, who sees him first. And a prophet baby, you know, a prophet infant. Can you imagine what they'd look like? This beaming, bright, illuminated, full of light child, as beautiful as you can get. And Musa and Asia, her name was, uh, Pharaoh's wife, fell in love with this child straight away. And... That's it. She just wanted, uh, she, she then فَالْتَقَطَهُ آلُ فِرْعَوْنَ لِيَكُونَ لَهُمْ عَدُوًّا وَحَزَنًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds this information. They picked him up. The people of the family of Pharaoh picked him up so that he would be their enemy and he would be their source of distress. And then he says إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ وَهَامَانَ وَجُلُودَهُمَا كَانُوا خَاطِئِينَ They, or Pharaoh, his people, they were all misguided. They were wrong and they were mistaken in this. They were making a big mistake in this but they don't know. This is woman power now being shown. Because Pharaoh said, this baby, kill it. Pharaoh's wife is saying, no, we don't have children. They didn't have children. We can make this our child. لا تقتلو. And that's what she's saying. وَقَالَتِ امْرَأَةُ فِرْعَوْنَ قُرَّةُ عَيْنٍ لِي وَلَكْ Says that this child is going to be the delight of my eye and your eye. My eye and your eye. The Pharaoh wasn't convinced. But sometimes you have to give in to your wife. And he gave in. And he probably regretted that until the last moment, <laughs> right? But I'm not trying to tell you guys anything from that. Right? At the end of the day, she was the one who became Muslim. She was the one who became a believer afterwards, not him. So this was all Allah's plan. Uh, and she's saying something very truthful. She's saying, do not kill him. Maybe he will benefit us. Or we can take him as a child. Certainly benefit us, not him, but her, yes. Because she was going to become a believer afterwards. There's a long story about her belief, but she was going to become a believer. So, can you imagine the good words that you say sometimes come out true to you? That Pharaoh's wife says these words and they truly are a benefit to her because she gets iman and faith because of him. وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ But they did not know. وَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَادُ أُمِّ مُوسَى فَارِغَ On the other hand, his mother is now trembling. She is taken over. She is taken over with extreme distress. My son has gone. What's going to happen to him? In kadat la tubdibihi lawla arrabatna ala qalbiha li takuna min al-mu'mineen. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing what a normal woman would do in this situation. She would just declare, this is my child, or whatever. You know, just to try to save it maybe. But Allah says, it was very close that she revealed this. Had we not strengthened her heart, and so that she can be of the true believers. وَقَالَتْ لِأُخْتِهِ قُصِّي She said to her, instead, she said to her daughter, Musa Ali had a sister, go and follow him, find out where he is. So now everybody knew that this child had been found. Musa Ali mother knows that it's her child because who else is found in a, in a box? Right? Now she's worried what's going to happen to this child. And uh, this kind of news spreads fast in those areas. Tells his, her, her daughter, go and follow and find out, what, keep an eye. So she is, فَبَصُرَتْ بِهِ عَنْ جُنُبٍ وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ So she is watching from the sidelines. They don't know that she is related to uh, this young, young boy. Now what Allah does, and when Allah wants to save somebody, when Allah wants to help somebody and support somebody, He helps them in the most miraculous ways possible. In the most ingenuous ways possible, in the most unexpected manner that you would never have even fathomed in your, in your entire life. This is the ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, وَحَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِ الْمَرَاضِ Straight away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had prohibited for any woman to feed him. And thus, they're trying different women, the best of, uh, nursing, uh, uh, of nursing mothers, but he wouldn't take to anybody's breast. He would not take to anybody, he would not drink from anybody. Now they're getting worried. He has to be fed. There's no SMA formula milk in those days. You know, this was all natural in those days. It was organic. Anyway, so uh, she, the sister of Musa alayhi salam, she's a prophet's sister, right? They obviously got some great qualities. So she sees her chances. هَلْ أَدُلُّكَ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتٍ يَكْفُلُونَهُ لَكْ should we tell you, can I tell you and indicate to you about a household who will assist you, uh, who will bring him up, who will help you, who will nurse him, and they will be very, uh, they'll be very compassionate on him. 
they're now suspicious. Why is she saying that? She says, no, no, this is a very good mother and I know, you know, because of other experiences and so on and so forth. So, okay, fine. So they brought her, they brought her in and as soon as they bring her in, Musa alayhi salam takes to her, starts drinking and they're all very happy. They're all very satisfied. Now they say, okay, this is your payment. This is what you're going to get. We give you this apartment. We give you this. We give you that. And they give her a whole, you know, salary or whatever. And she says, I can't stay here. I've got other children. I've got other responsibilities. If you want me to do it, I'm going to do it at home. So they agreed. They begrudgingly agreed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings back her son. فَرَدَدْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ أُمِّهِ So we returned him to her mother, to his mother. So that her eyes continue to be gladdened And that she not be grieved And this is all news for us Why is Allah telling us that? His mother had her benefit She's experienced whatever she's experienced But Allah tells us because this is what the story is about You do something for Allah You ask Allah And when Allah wants it to happen Then he says so that we can gladden her eyes, we can make sure she's not distressed, and so that she knows that when Allah promises something, it will be the truth. That is what is we are being told. When Allah has told you that this will happen if you are wa antumul a'launa in kuntum mu'minin, that you will remain elevated if you are true believers, because at this time we have many challenges in front of us, and a lot of people who are on the fringe are giving up. They're jumping off the train of iman. They want to just completely make themselves out to be something else. And a lot of people are being lost here because the iman is being shaken for many people. Now Allah is promising, This religion at the core of it is the religion of following, of believing in the unseen. Those people who believe in the unseen. And that is a massive requirement. But it's a massive challenge. It's not easy. Allah help us all. So... وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ As Allah says, most people don't know. Anyway, that's how he gets saved. He's brought up in this royal splendor. Everything at his disposal. He's brought up. There's not much information about what else he did. But it, then Allah says, وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَاسْتَوَىٰ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِي الْمُحْسِنِينَ When he then grew up and became strong enough, became independent, and you know, had his own mind to do things, we gave him, we gave him حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا we gave him both uh, uh, ability uh, 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 of uh, judicial insight, of understanding, and we gave him knowledge as well. Now the story continues, and essentially what happens is, he is fine, he is a privileged Bani Israel. He's a privileged Israelite. All the others are enslaved, he's privileged, right? So you can imagine what that, how, uh, you know, when you become a privileged individual, you can understand what that might be uh, for a person in that kind of society. However, on one occasion, he's going at noontime, he's outside, and there's a man from his tribe, meaning from the Bani Israel, from the Israelites, who's having some argument with a copt, with one of the locals as such, right, the, the, the leadership. Um, so this Bani Israel knows that Musa alayhi salam has a lot of influence, so he calls him over, he says, look, this guy is always arguing with me. So Musa alayhi salam tried to stop whatever was going on and just whack the other person one. When he whacked him one, he only did it to, call, you know, to kind of shove him away, move him away, to calm him down. But Musa alayhi salam did not know his own power. So when he hit him, he was given obviously the, uh, he had the power of prophets, but was he to know that? He killed him. Now as soon as he killed him, Musa alayhi salam walked away. Nobody knows, somebody, I mean, only the, the other Bani Israel person knew that Musa alayhi salam did this. Now nobody else knows, but they're looking for who is the murderer. Is it that royal, is that royal Bani Israel that's being brought up in the house of Pharaoh? The next day, Musa alayhi salam is obviously worried. The next day, as he's going along, he sees that same man, the same Bani Israel, who's arguing with somebody else this time. And he calls him over again. As Musa alayhi salam goes there, he first tells him off. Like, you're messing around all the time. You're causing these fights and so on and so forth. Then he turned around, apparently, to try to deal with the other man. And this person became so frightened now that he's already told me off. He's going to sort him out. Then he's going to sort me out. So he says, oh, you just want to be tyrannical and oppressive in the world. And that's what you did yesterday and so on and so forth. And that's it. Musa Alisam didn't do anything afterwards. Musa Alisam went away. But obviously now the news reached the Pharaoh and others that this was him. 
It was Musa alayhi salam. So eventually what happens is that there was another believer, a friend of Musa alayhi salam, who's a, who's a Copt. Uh, he was from the people of Pharaoh. He's the other believer there. He came silently telling him that, look, they are in their highest uh, councils. They are making, uh, they're, they're consulting with each other. To, and they're going to take care of you. So I would suggest that you just leave. So then he goes to Madian. I'm not going to go into detail about Madian because that's a long story, but that's where he goes and spends several years down there and he gets married there. On his way back from that, on the way back from that, he gets prophecy. He's given Nubuwa. He's given the prophecy. And then he's told to go back to Pharaoh and to start challenging him, to give him da'wah in a positive challenge. Qula lahu qawla layyina. Give, uh, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, speak to him in a soft tone. Use soft spoken language with him. Now, subhanallah, if Allah is telling Musa alayhi salam to speak to a tyrant who calls himself God in softness, then where does it justify for us to do military ahlu sunnah wal jah? What is it called? Amr bil ma'ruf an nahi anil munkar. Where you suddenly become, individuals become enlightened, religious, and then they go home and they start causing a havoc with everybody else. They want to throw the TV out the next day and they want to like make everybody become waliullah in one day. It just doesn't work. If Allah tells Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam to deal with Pharaoh like that in the beginning, to give him his opportunity and his chance, then uh, that's another lesson that we get from that. Now what happens is, Musa alayhi salam says, I've got a slight uh, impediment in my speech. And there's a story why that happened, but I've got a slight Im impediment, I want support. So we understand from this that you can ask for support, you don't have to do it alone. And my brother is more eloquent than me. My brother is uh, more efficient than me in his speech. He's more, uh, he, he's more effective. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives his brother, uh, uh, appoints his brother for him. His brother is a prophet. Musa alayhi salam is a messenger. He's on a higher rank. So they go to Pharaoh, they speak to him, and there's a whole discussion that takes place. There's a whole discussion that takes place. Musa alayhi salam, uh, first Pharaoh tries to use the, uh, the excuse or tries to use the... Uh, the card that I brought you up and now you are so ungrateful that you are doing this to us. Musa Ali said, look, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but, uh, and he says, you've committed this crime of killing that man. Musa Ali said, yes, that was the case, but I was mistaken in that case. I was mistaken at that time. They have, uh, there's, a, there's a long story about what happens after that. They have uh, a to and fro. And finally, what happens is that Musa alayhi salam is told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you need to take the Bani Israel and you need to leave at night. You need to leave. So the news had spread among the Bani Israel that you gather whatever you can. And what they apparently did was they took gold from their masters. They stole the gold from their masters. They all got together and then Musa alayhi salam led them out. Pharaoh and obviously his people found out I'm cutting it really short, obviously, right? Just to show the end of this story from where I started. And uh, finally, they get to the river. And behind them is the Pharaoh, and in front of them is the river. Where do they go now? But Israel was such that they used to complain a lot. Even at this time, they start complaining to Musa alayhi salam. Now they're saying, now they were enslaved there. They were in misery there. They have persecuted there. Now they started saying, we were better off there. Now we have the sea in front of us. We have this water in front of us. Behind us, we've got the enemy. We've got the army. That's it. It's the end of us. Musa alayhi salam is told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hit, hit the, uh, the, the surface of the water with your, with your staff. Right? And as he did so, the water just suddenly wells up to both, onto both sides and it creates a dry passage. So literally the water just walls up as though there's an invisible glass wall that's holding up the water to the two sides and they're just walking through. Now Pharaoh and his people, they are, they are at a short distance behind. When they come up, the water doesn't coalesce together yet. So it's not like it let Musa Ali Salam go through and then after that it uh, shut down straight away, but it lets Pharaoh come in. It lets Pharaoh come in and he reckons, wonderful, this happens for me. You know, because you then interpret everything according to your understanding of the way things work. As they get to the middle, the water 
the sides break. The control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he, he tells them, he tells it to come back down, and it comes back down. Now, Musa, the, now Pharaoh, it seems at this point, it seems at this point that he had been struggling with himself. Wallahu alam. And I, I take this as something, as a very important message, because he says at the end that I believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun. But he's saying this now when he's about to die. And there's two things here. Number one is that when a person is about to die, when a person is about to die, they generally see the reality. Everything opens up to them. So that's why we have this concept in Islam called the husnul khatima and su'ul khatima. A good ending state and an evil ending state. What that means is, husnul khatima is that when a person dies, imagine it like this. You've just been through an exam that you are really trying hard for. You've answered all of these questions. You are doubtful about some of them, but you thought you did well. You generally, you know, you have this feeling after an exam. You come outside, you grab your textbooks, and you go and check your answers, right? Now, if there was a question or two that you are confident about, but when you checked and you discovered how messed up you were, right, how wrong you were, can you imagine how you feel? One is you don't know in the exam chamber and you try to write the best. When you go and you find out what's right, you don't feel so bad. You already knew you didn't know. But in this case where you thought you knew, whereas you didn't know that you didn't know. And then can you imagine how bad that is? So what happens at death, the ulama mentioned, is that when reality comes about, Allah opens up everything to show how they really are, what faith really is. Then we reflect on the life that we led and what the reality was if they come together, and if they were the same and your, your answers were correct, meaning your, your, your life was correct, you feel great. You feel great. Just like when you come out and you ask somebody, the answer to that one was this, right? And I said, yes, alhamdulillah, that's so wonderful. That's how it feels, husnul khatima. At least in an exam, you can do a reset. In this case, you don't do a reset. So think the reality opens up. For Pharaoh, it seems that the reality opens up, but iman at that time is not accepted. Because once you see start seeing the next world as such, seeing the, rea the reality, you start receding from this world, then there is nothing that's except, you're beyond accountability now. You're sealed. That's why you call it khatim, khatima, which means a seal. It's either a good seal or a bad seal. So there are stories about that Jibreel Ali was shoving sand in his mouth to make sure he doesn't say it, just in case Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being so compassionate and merciful the way he is, he might even forgive him. Right? He might just forgive him. But Allah chooses to mention that in the Qur'an. He chooses to mention that in the Qur'an, that this is what Pharaoh said. So for me, what this tells me, for me, this is what this tells me, is that even people who are tyrannical, even people who are just so full of themselves and so arrogant and so violent and everything else, they do have vulnerable moments. They do think in themselves sometimes, am I doing what I'm doing is right? They do sometimes even want to make a change. But all the glitz around them, all the power around them is so intoxicating. It's so intoxicating that they seldomly break through that barrier. And this is a lesson for us, that do not set up around yourself false sense of security, false sense of uh, materialism. Anything besides Allah that you have so much trust in, then it's difficult to get out of that. And as young men and women that I'm speaking to today, we're still developing, we're still in that development stage where we're still studying at university. We're going to go out there and make these kind of decisions. We're going to go into different fields and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help you to help the Muslimin. May Allah use you in the service of the believers. But when, when you become successful, when you get the contacts and you're moving in the right circles, don't let that intoxicate you. Because at the end of the day, if nothing else, we're going to die and will be nothing anyway. Let us look at the past in history. Let us consider our future in terms of what happens afterwards. Let us reflect over the story of, of Musa salam and, and Pharaoh and read his story. If you get a chance, read the full story of Pharaoh. There are so many lessons and that's why Musa is, and, and Pharaoh, they are some of the most quoted 
individuals in the Quran. The Musa and Pharaoh story is not in one place. It is in so many different places. And it's different views you get from it, different perspectives you get from this. So that if one doesn't affect you, the other one will. If that one doesn't, then the third one will, inshallah. So that's what the Quran is there for. That's why this story is there for. That's why we showed one angle of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Because Pharaoh tried to, Pharaoh tried to avoid the inevitable. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his own ways to get these things done. This shouldn't make us passive, but it should make us just hopeful. And we keep trying, and may Allah get grant us strength. May Allah grant us strength. May Allah grant us and our progeny strength against all of the pharaonic ideas that will come around us. Wa akhirud da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Keep the faith.